for the delay. Uh, so welcome to the fifth session on CDGB seminar. I'm Yasu Furukawa from Simon Fraser University. Uh, we have yet another exciting program today. We have Tom Funkhauser uh, from Google Princeton giving a talk, followed by an extended Q&A session joined by Gordon Redstein uh, from Stanford and Richard Zan from Simon Fraser University. And for any questions you want to ask to the speaker or the panelist, uh, feel free to use the YouTube chat box. Uh, you should see at the either right or the bottom of your screen and type anything in the chat box at any time. Uh, so let me do the introduction. Uh, we have Tom Funkhauser today. Uh, Tom is an emeritus professor at Princeton and also a research scientist at Google. Uh, he joined Princeton as a faculty in 1998 and has been a professor since 2009. Uh, Tom has won ACM SIGGRAPH Computer Graphics Awards in 2014, Sloan Foundation Fellowship in 1999, and NSF Career Award in 2000. As you might know, Tom has been a leading figure in geometry processing, recently heavily started working in 3D vision, and more recently in robotics. And so we really wish to have Tom to be a speaker in this series, which is about geometry processing and computer vision. So uh, Tom will talk about learning implicit 3D shape representation today. And without further ado, uh, let me welcome Tom Funkhauser. Uh, Tom, uh, it's all yours now. Thank you. Um, do you see my screen? Uh, yes. Perfect. Uh, great, thank you. So yeah, I'm gonna talk about learning implicit 3D shape representations. Um, so the general topic of the seminar, I believe, and then of this talk as well, and probably a few that came before it, is just try to ask the question, uh, what is the right 3D shape representation for different kinds of applications? Uh, and although there are many possible applications that you might want to represent 3D shapes, uh, I'm going to focus on ones that you'd like to uh, understand how to manipulate shape, which requires understanding a little bit of its structure, a little bit of its shape, and being able to do queries on it, like, you know, are you inside it or what's the distance to it and things like that. Uh, for many applications, the kinds of properties that you'd want in a 3D shape representation are that it accurately reflects a shape so that um, there's not approximations due to a coarse set of voxels or a small number of faces or things like that, uh, that it can represent any kind of shape. It doesn't just do chairs, but it can do <laughs> any kind. Um, that it's concise, the number of bytes required to represent a shape is, is, is relative, is small, you know, no more than the, the amount of detail in the shape. That it's structured in that um, you can understand maybe part decompositions, whether they're semantic or not, but like structural decomposition so that you can make queries about how uh, different aspects of the shape relate to each other. Uh, that it's queryable so that uh, for, depending on your application, you might care about, uh, am I going to be in contact with the shape? You know, am I inside, outside? You know, what is the volume? You know, whatever the, whatever the queries that you want to make of a shape, those should be efficient. And of course, as you know, not all uh, 3D representations are equally efficient at all queries. Uh, it would be nice if uh, the shape representation could be learned from priors, which might help with its conciseness and uh, its accuracy. And then uh, if it could be inferred from observations, like uh, either a depth image or an RGB image or things like that, uh, that would be a really nice property of a shape representation. Okay. Um, looking at traditional 3D representations, uh, like meshes or point clouds or voxels or even 2.5D images, they have some of these properties, uh, but most, most of them they don't. So uh, with an infinite amount of data, they can be very accurate. If I have enough voxels or enough faces in my mesh or points in my point cloud, I can represent any shape uh, very, very in very great, great detail. But then you would be then f sacrificing conciseness uh, for that accuracy. So uh, you know, a few faces you get conciseness uh, in a mesh, uh, but not very accurate, and vice versa if you have lots of faces. 
Um, these representations have little to no structure. Uh, for different ones, they support different kinds of queries. So for voxels, of course, you can check whether you're inside or outside if it's an occupancy grid. Uh, for meshes, not so much. Uh, and then vice versa for querying uh, of positions along the surface. But anyway, uh, they're not learned, of course. They're explicit representations that are, are not based on any particular shape prior, and they're very difficult to infer from images. Okay, so going back a few years, you know, several years now, 2015 or so, people started looking at learned 3D shape representations, uh, you know, where you might uh, have an uh, autoencoder where you would encode some observation to some latent code and then decode it to an explicit representation, like voxels or meshes or things like that. And in comparison to the uh, explicit methods that are traditional, uh, the shape can be very concise. It could be just a latent code uh, uh, per shape. The decoder weights are actually quite expensive, but they're shared among all shapes. And so uh, people don't usually consider that as part of the size of the shape, uh, but you know you have to count, count that. So you have to amortize the cost of the decoder across all shapes. But anyway, the latent code itself is very, uh, can be very, late, uh, very small. Uh, of course, they're learned from shape priors and there are encoders that can infer, you know, infer a latent code from an image that can then be decoded to a 3D shape. So, great. Uh, they're not structured in the way that I described, where different parts of the shape uh, are understood to be related to each other and other parts not, you know, like a, a structural decomposition into parts or anything like that. But there is some structure to the the representation of the shape, where if you move in a, in a latent space, uh, you might be uh, moving in a way that's uh, structurally or semantically relevant. Uh, this picture that popped up here is a picture where the colors are by category of shape, but it could be that this is chairs with arms versus chairs without arms and stuff like that. But um, there's no real understanding of what that structure is. Uh, in a way that's useful for many applications that require structure, like uh, collision detection or uh, symmetry or you know, anything like that. It's just you're moving in the space. Okay. Um, and then the traditional learned representations, if you're just looking at the, a latent code in some feature vector, it's very difficult to ask, you know, am I inside the shape? How far from it am I? And then more, more importantly, uh, they generally are not very accurate. The, the latent codes uh, decoding uh, to voxels or meshes or things like that produce, mesh, produce outputs that are not nearly as good as say traditional representations. And um, many of the methods that are trained with learned representations are not very general. So they only work for certain object classes that we're trained on. I mean, they take advantage of shape priors, but if you were to throw lots of object categories all together, then they wouldn't train very well. So, more recently, as you all know, people have started to focus on implicit 3D shape representations, where the encoder produces a latent code, and the decoder takes in a position, x, y, z, and a latent code, and then outputs the value of a function, where the function might be whether you're inside or outside the shape, or it might be a distance to the closest point on the surface, or assigned distance to the closest point on the surface or something like that. And so you're basically learning a latent code and a function that the decoder computes that can be used uh, to, re to evaluate queries uh, on the shape. Great. Um, and then of course, if you want an explicit representation, you can run those queries lots of times and, and then reconstruct an explicit representation. For example, if you had something that was giving you the sign distance or an inside output side function, you could uh, run a query at every place on a grid cell and then run marching cubes uh, to get back an explicit reconstruction. Um, these methods uh, are more accurate than the previous learned methods. Uh, the, the function itself isn't on a discretized space. And so you're not limited to a particular voxel resolution or mesh resolution or anything like that. And, and there has been other people that have demonstrated the value of that for accuracy. Um, uh, but they also are not that accurate. And uh, 
have the same problem where they don't necessarily generalize well to a broad range of shapes. Uh, most of the results are trained on a small number of categories and demonstrated on those same categories. Okay. There's been a million papers that are variants of implicit shape representations. You know, a small handful are, 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 are listed here. Um, I'm gonna describe two papers that were written by one of my PhD students, Kyle Genova, that uh, get at these core properties that you like in a 3D shape, uh, which combine accuracy, generality, and structure. And the way they're gonna do that is by decomposing the shape into local regions and then learning an implicit function for each of those local regions and then compositing them to uh, produce the final shape. Great. Uh, so those, those two papers, one are from, from ICCV 2019 and one's from CVPR 2020. Um, and again, the student here that really did all this work is Kyle Genova, uh, who's pictured here. Okay, so let me go and then describe these two papers. And, and again, mostly focusing on the ideas behind them rather than the details. Um, great, so structured implicit functions. So the, the goal of this particular project was not necessarily to reconstruct shapes with high accuracy, but rather to uh, learn a structured decomposition of shapes into local shape elements in a way that's consistent across uh, related shapes. Um, in this particular project, the, the, the input was uh, an image or a depth image or a 3D point cloud. Uh, and it runs through a CNN and then it outputs a representation that is shown on the right where the, the object is decomposed into local shape elements, these things represented by ellipses, ellipsoids, um, uh, directly, and each of the, 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 the feature vector that represents a, an object is an explicit representation of a shape where each of the colored boxes corresponds to one of these, these ellipsoids in space. And again, the, the goal here was to uh, decompose an object into local regions in a consistent way. So what do we do for these local regions? As I said, we use a Gaussian to represent each of the local regions. And so this like harkens back to the 80s with regards to a shape representation in 3D graphics, where there's an implicit function f of x uh, that uh, looks at the parameters on some Gaussian theta, uh, a mixture of Gaussians, and the value of the implicit function is the sum of those Gaussians. So on the picture on the right, there are two Gaussians and uh, the, the implicit function is the sum of those two Gaussians and then some level set at value L uh, defines where the surface is. If you're less than that, then you're inside the surface. If you're greater than that, you're outside the surface and if you're equal to that, you're on the surface. And computer graphics, people have called these things blobby models or metaballs or soft objects. And they're, they're one of many possible representations of shape in graphics. Uh, the motivation for back, you know, this is 1991, for that kind of representation is, is that you can, by adding more and more of these Gaussians, you can get uh, you know, more and more detail. Um, uh, and then, but the important thing is just that it's an implicit function. So uh, it's independent of topology or, uh, you know, and if, uh, if I were to change things in one Gaussian, the overall implicit function would move smoothly would change smoothly. And so gradients and things like that are, are, are smooth. And so that's the property that we were going to, we're going to use um, for learning them. And that's why I think they're a good choice for learning them. Since that basically changes to the parameters of the Gaussians affect the implicit function smoothly and can represent a wide variety of shapes with different topologies and things like that with, without uh, discontinuities in the gradients. Okay, so our particular local shape elements are just gonna be anisotropic Gaussians. Uh, the parameters are such that there's a rotation for every uh, uh, of these Gaussians. There's a center point, there are three radii, and there's a, this thing on the left, the CI in blue is a global scaling factor, not a global, a local scaling factor for that Gaussian, uh, which can take a value of zero, a positive number. And so, uh, that effectively ends up getting used to turn on and off Gaussians. 
So if the value is zero, then the when the this particular Gaussian summed into the the, the global function, uh, that won't have any effect. And so from a from a learning perspective, it's uh, our network's going to learn to tr you know to use these CIs to handle extra and missing parts uh, by by ramping up and down these CI values. Okay, so then we're gonna train a network with a, a set of shapes such that we run it through a very simple network. This is the actual architecture that uh, is going to output uh, one of these, we're gonna, I'm gonna call it a template for now, which is this mixture of Gaussians. Um, rather than giving a 3D input surface, you know, as a mesh or, some, or a point cloud directly, what we end up doing is if we, if we had a 3D surface, which we use during training, um, then we actually represented it as a stack of 20 depth images uh, acquired by rendering the 3D surface from corners of a, of a dodecahedron. Um, and so the input to the network is a stack of 20 depth images and the output is, um, and then it runs through five convolutional nanos and four connected layers. And the output is, um, 10 parameters for each of the Gaussians. Again, three for rotation, three for position, three for scale, and one of the CI for the magnitude. So each of these colored boxes in the, in the feature vector is, is actually 10 numbers representing one Gaussian. And then for a fixed number of Gaussians, we have experimented with 10, 25, or 100. Um, it, it just one forward pass to the network produces the, the parameters for these Gaussians. Um, such that uh, they cover the shape, describe the shape. And then we have a, a loss, which uh, is if I were to evaluate the implicit function, uh, how, how well does that, the inside outside of that implicit function match the inside outside of the real shape? Great. Um, so, the reason that I believe that this is a good way to infer structure of a shape is that uh, the mixture of Gaussians actually can describe a reasonable isosurface for shapes without too many Gaussians. So here's an example of 100 Gaussians used to represent an airplane. And uh, again, like we're not aiming for surface reconstruction as our primary target here. What we're aiming for is consistent structural decomposition. But by having a, a, a reconstruction loss, uh, then we are, it's important that our reconstructions are reasonable. Um, so in contrast to like previous work by Tolsiani et al and others have considered using similar approaches for decomposing into a small number of boxes. So Tolsiani, uh, considered a similar approach for de re re to decomposing objects into like three to six boxes or something like that. Uh, there, it's very difficult to use a, a reconstruction loss to get back a you know detailed uh, decomposition. Whereas our mixture of Gaussians here, we can have lots of Gaussians. We can have um, uh, or few, and in either case, the reconstruction of the isosurface gives a good signal for whether you're decomposing properly. Okay, the main benefit, in my opinion, of using this representation as a way to learn structure with a deep network is that the shapes, the templates, the, the implicit functions defined by the templates, the templates being the, the mixture of Gaussians, uh, very smoothly uh, with typical variations of shape in shape databases. So if, if parts move, like the wings moved or have different shape or things like that, the uh, variation from one shape to the next uh, is a smooth change in the parameters of the representation. Um, and so what that does is it allows the network to learn a consistent set of de decomposition of shapes into these mixture of Gaussians um, uh, across a wide variety of shapes. So if you looked at the uh, tip of the right wing, there's a cyan teal looking blob in each of these examples here that's consistent across all of them. The 37th blob is, uh, is always the same. And then, you know, anywhere you look, the blue, the blue ellipsoid in the back by the tail or something like that, that's the same one. 
And there was nothing in the training procedure or in the losses that required the network to produce consistency. It's just that that was the easiest thing for it to do. And because the, the functions that it's reproducing are smooth, I think it was able to learn the consistency uh, efficiently. And, and then, then that's why I think this is a good representation. Um, the, the, the templates are also quite expressive. So uh, the, they can represent arbitrary topologies, uh, the slats in the back of the chair or the, you know, the legs and things like that. Um, and again, changes between the seat with a, a solid back and slats in the back is a smooth change in this representation, whereas with meshes or you know, other representations, not so much. And then it's also an expressive shape space. So for this particular paper, the, the next thing I'm gonna show you is kind of the main result, which is that this is gonna be a video. And the thing on the left here is the shape space. The little dots are, are colored by semantic class of the 3DR2N2 data set with 13 different classes. Uh, a model was trained with all 13 classes together uh, to produce a shape space, where again, the shape space is 10 parameters times 100, uh, 100 uh, ellipsoids, that's 700 uh, parameters. And the middle thing is gonna be, uh, as this red dot moves around, the decomposition of the shape in that place. And then the right side is gonna be the isosurface reconstruction for that. And what you should be noticing here is that there's great consistency with certainly within a class of the uh, usage of the ellipsoids. So that for the chair, the, the ellipsoids are not just jumping all over the place and every chair uses a different one. Uh, it's, it's using a very, very consistent set of ellipsoids for every example within the same class. And even sometimes across classes, like if it were to use benches to couches to chairs, it would still be using the same ellipsoids for the left, right, the, the left front leg. Um, and again, this is only achieved by having a pretty simple network with a, with a, a loss that's a reconstruction loss. There's nothing here that's in, enforcing and consistency or anything like that. So the conclusion from all that is that uh, it is possible to train a network that does a structured decomposition of shapes in a way that is not dependent on a, a particular class, like we train 13 different classes together, uh, but produces a good consistency across the decompositions for similar objects. So in this example here, again, the, the, the green uh, ellipsoid and the, the closest to us in the bottom is representing the right front leg of both an easy chair and a dining room chair. And then if you looked around, there's just incredible consistency across all the different ellipsoids you know, in these examples, even though they're very different from each other. Um, it does not produce the greatest consistent uh, reconstructions. The things on the right here are not like world-class reconstructions, but they're good enough to guide the template inference to produce the right set of de decompositions. Uh, and that was the point. Okay. So that was the takeaway from that first project on uh, local, uh, on structured implicit functions. The second thing I'm going to talk about is aimed a little more at surface reconstruction quality. So we're going to take similar ideas. We're going to take an input and we're going to decompose it into Gaussians, just same as before. But we're going to store with each of those Gaussians a latent vector that is going to be used by a decoder to produce a local implicit function. And then the, in the same way that we had local implicit functions before that were just Gaussians, now we're going to have local implicit functions that are learned, and they're, they're going to combine to produce a global implicit function, which is going to be used to produce a reconstruction. Um, so this is combining ideas of, of implicit functions like octet and things like that with ideas of structured implicit functions with structural decomposition to hopefully get the best of both worlds. OK, so how does that work? Um, the input again, we'll say is uh, a set of depth images that were either from a single depth image or from a, uh, a, a three dimensional model that was rendered into a stack of images. Um, and then the similar uh, 
process is going to be used to extract a template. So the top part here is going to be producing a set of Gaussians like, that are shown in, inside the person on the top here, up, up there. Um, and then the key to this whole thing is that uh, it's going to actually pull out the point samples that are relevant for each of those Gaussians. And then it's going to do a, use a local shape encoder to produce a latent factor for each of the Gaussians. So going back to this picture here, there is a Gaussian that came out of our template extractor that's for the arm. And so it's going to pull out the points that are in the neighborhood of that ellipsoid. And then it's going to use a local shape encoder. We use a point net to turn those points for that Gaussian into a latent vector. So for each of the, the result of that is that uh, the input is decomposed into a set of Gaussians, and each of those Gaussians has a latent vector that was encoded from the local area around that Gaussian. Uh, this is in contrast to almost every other prior uh, 3D learning method that just has a global encoder, uh, and, and which then makes it very difficult to reconstruct uh, you know, good shape quality and to generalize to arbitrary objects. Uh, then the back end of this is very similar to uh, an octnet or something like that, where you're taking an aquarium location, which is in the green box up here, and then you have a latent vector, which is decomposed into template parameters and deep features. Um, interestingly, uh, our reconstruction we found to be most useful and, and the learning to be most efficient if we retain the Gaussian aspect of our original templates. And so the, the, you know, for each of the local functions that we're going to produce, uh, we're going to compute a Gaussian, which is, where, which is called the template influence here. And then we're going to ask the deep network to produce a function that's a deviation from that Gaussian. Uh, rather than asking the, the local network to produce the, the local implicit function completely itself, uh, we find it's actually helpful to ask it to produce something that's a, a difference from, from the Gaussian. Uh, so it's a simpler function. It doesn't have to learn the, the size and the aspect ratio and all that of this local part that's already provided by the Gaussian. And so uh, it only has to learn its deviations from that, which is cool. And so then the sum of these local functions produce uh, an entire function, the LDIF, which can be evaluated at any location x. Cool. So the takeaways from that are twofold. One is, is that there's a local shape in Carter. That's quite different than previous methods. And the second is, is that uh, we asked the deep network to produce a residual with respect to something else, uh, which is also very, very helpful. Trains much faster and better. OK. So some of the results that you would get from that, um, we can look at shape autoencoding, where again, we, we take in uh, 3D shapes and then we try to run them through this process and reproduce the original shape. Um, if we were to compare to the top left is the stuff that I talked about in the first part of this talk, this just the mixture of Gaussians and just literally treating each of the local areas as a Gaussian and summing them, you get kind of blobbier shapes. Again, the point of that project was more about consistent reconstruction, uh, consistent decomposition, not re shape reconstruction, but that's what you would get. Uh, if you were to run OCNET, you'd get something like this, uh, which would be a state of the art at the time um, 3D implicit function. And then the bottom left is what you get from LDIF and the ground truth is that. And, and again, like the little uh, bulges that you get on the uh, base of the lamp here would be difficult to get through a global encoding of an entire object. Uh, another example would be uh, this boat here, where uh, again, it's just you get, uh, I think, better local details uh, with a local encoder and this local decoding than you would with a global encoder and a global decoding like you would with ArcNet. One more example, a gun. So again, there's, there's quite a bit of detail that you get from this local encoding and decoding. We look at this quantitatively. Uh, I think most people would look at a table like the one on the bottom left, which is, is reporting IOU and chamfer. This is, a, this is on the typical 3DR2N2 data set. Uh, 
um, where there's a training set and a test set and such. These are results on the test set, of course, uh, from that data set. Um, uh, however, I don't think that those kinds of numbers are that useful. Uh, I think that a lot of the errors come from a small number of examples. And so if we produce mean IOUs and things like that, um, I think that, that that doesn't tell the whole story. So on the right, what we usually do when we look at our results is we produce uh, distributions of errors and compare methods according to that distribution. This particular distribution is uh, the horizontal axis is all the shapes in, in, our two, in, the, in the test set um, that are sorted from least F score error or, or highest F score to lowest F score according to our method. And so the blue curve here is, is our method and it's a monotonically decreasing curve because th that's how things were sorted. The orange curve shows the error for that same example that you get from Octet and the green curve shows the same error you get for that same example in, in structure implicit functions, the thing I talked about in the first talk, part of the talk. Um, what you get from this is that the, uh, first, first of all, the, 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 the mean error is again, greatly affected by these worst case results. Uh, you know, half of them are almost perfect. And then, uh, you know, there's a few at the end. And so that's what's really mostly affecting these mean results. But um, in almost every case, the, the deep structure, the deep uh, local deep implicit function is, is, is superior to the other two methods. Um, the pictures up top show some examples of places on this curve, in particular the, the, the rightmost column, this lamp looking thing shows the worst case for our, me for our method. Um, and uh, apparently we do a very poor job there. We, we predict almost nothing for that particular case. But I, I think that people in general should produce results that look like this rather than averages and tables like this typical. Um, one of the advantages of storing, of learning functions that are on local regions of shape is that it's possible to generalize to unseen classes. Um, the, the deep network only has to reproduce the local shape within one Gaussian. And therefore, and since local shapes are reused across many different object classes, it's more plausible that you'll get generalization um, to other, to, to other ad object categories. So here's a result of an experiment where you train on the 13 classes in R2N2, and then you test on example shapes from other classes like birdhouse and bed and camera and so on and so forth. Um, the results on the right are displayed the same way. And the bottom, there's a, a curve, which is F score from, from best to worst, according to our method, and some examples uh, along the way. Again, the rightmost column is our worst case uh, in this experiment, the, 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 but it's still not terrible. The camera uh, in the second row is, you know, kind of like a camera. It's certainly better than the other methods. Um, and you know, if you looked at the mean F score difference, it's 66.6 .6 for ArcNet versus 84.4 for ours. And these results definitely just basically confirm the motivation for going to a local shape encoding approach and decoding approach, which is that you get generalization from that. Uh, you get both accuracy and generalization. Um, we also did experiments where we encode depth images and, and, and try to complete them. So in this experiment, we're gonna have, we have known pose uh, and the input is a, is a depth image. And so the, the input is like a green point cloud that looks like the thing on the top. And then the ground truth is, is, is shown as a gray overlay. And then our prediction versus an ArcNet prediction is, is, is the example here. Um, again, the, the difference in an F score on average is quite high. Uh, and uh, the results are generally higher in almost every example with our method. Um, the, the, the final aspect of this local encoding that is particularly useful is that the, the implicit, the, the network that can evaluates the implicit function for a local region can be much simpler than the network that that it decodes uh, an entire shape. 
Uh, so we have a very simplified version of ACNET for our local decoder that has less than 1% of the decoder parameters of a full ACNET. Uh, and again, we can get away with that because the shape space of local regions within Gaussians is much simpler than the shape space of entire objects. And so uh, we are able to get higher decoding accuracy, but with less than 1% of the parameters. Um, and so things are, it's really fast. Um, you might ask yourself, okay, well, you have to run this for every, every Gaussian. And so if you have 100 Gaussians, uh, you might have to run this network 100 times to get the value for one point. Uh, and in the worst case, I guess that's true. But we have efficient methods where we figure out what the influence of each Gaussian is. If you remember, the, 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 the Gaussian values modulate the learned values. And so we can bound the influence of each Gaussian. Let's call it three sigma. And on average, the each point in 3D space is, is overlapped by a small number of Gaussians. And so maybe two, three, something like that. So if we go back and look at some of these uh, Gaussian decompositions, they're spread out. And so each point is, um, is, is, is influenced by a small number of Gaussians. And so we don't get this 100 times factor. We, you know, it's a couple of times, but, but there's, again, less than 1% of the parameters. So it's a huge spin, win, win in, in efficiency. OK. So the takeaways of this is that this particular representation has almost all the properties that we asked for in our list of desirable properties. Um, it's not perfect in most of them, but it's certainly a step forward uh, relative to other learned representation in almost all of them. So it's, it's more accurate than, than other learned functions, uh, again, because it's locally encoding and locally decoding, uh, it can get higher accuracy. For the same reason, it gets better generality. Uh, the shape space of, of local uh, areas of shapes is much uh, easier, more easy to, to generalize than entire shapes. Uh, it's relatively concise. Uh, the first thing I described has 10 numbers for each of the ellipsoids. The second thing I described, we have 10 numbers plus 32 uh, dimensional vectors for each of the ellipsoids. Um, so compared to many other representations, that's that's quite concise. Um, it's structured. So this even when you learn end to end with the implicit functions that learned in addition to the ellipsoids, it still produces a consistent structure across the entire shape. And so you can reason about correspondences and, and all kinds of other uh, nice properties that you get from, from stru consistent structure across a class of shapes. Um, it's queryable, at least for inside outside. Um, it's efficient, and as you learn from shape prior, and can be learned in this case so far for depth images. I'll talk more about uh, inferring from other images. Okay, so the summary of all that is, is that uh, I talked about two methods that learn implicit functions of 3D shapes. Uh, and they provide, this, at least the second of them, provides state-of-the-art accuracy among the learned models, at least as of CPT VPR 2020, um, that simultaneously encode structure and, and shape, and, uh, and therefore is useful for either of those two applications. Uh, limitations are many, but, you know, so far, they've only been tested in kind of standalone settings of synthetic data sets like ShapeNet. Uh, and the training and procedure in our particular method requires an inside-outside query. Uh, I'm sure that there are things that you could do, like assign agnostic loss and things like that to get around that. But so far, we have not experimented with any of that. OK, so a question would be to go what, what to do from here. Um, there are lots of questions you could ask. Uh, what, you know, input data should, you know, how would it work with different input data? You know, what local reasons should you use? So on and so forth. And I'm going to go through some of these as uh, ideas of things that we've done and then some things that other people have done and, and talk about, like, where should we go from here? Let's talk about input data first. So far, I've, I described results only for autoencoding. So the input is a 3D shape and you're just trying to reproduce it. So that's uh, 
just trying to represent a shape as efficiently, as accurately as possible. And then inference from posed depth images, which is a you know real application, but then you need another pose of the image. So that's what I've done so subscribe so far. So then the question is, could you use other things like RGB images or things like that? And there's a there's an interesting challenge in that, which rates directly at the heart of this uh, LBIF encoder, which is that it does local shape encoding. So it extracts out a set of 3D points for each of the Gaussians and then encodes those. And so if you don't know the positions of 3D points uh, and, and which Gaussians that they're part of, then it would be hard to take this approach. And so that might limit it to, can you use unposed RGB images and so forth? Okay, so we've investigated that. Uh, the way that we attack that issue is that we start with an unposed RGB image and we run an off the shelf death estimation network. And then we run a very simple pose estimation network. And then that gives us a pose depth image that goes straight into the LDIF encoder that we've already trained. So in fact, the way that we've experimented with this so far is not even end to end, just having a pre-trained depth estimator, pre-trained pose estimator, and then give that as if it was a depth image, a pose depth image to LDIF. Um, this is interesting from perspective of uh, how well does this kind of approach work and what kind of benefits do you get? The, the benefits that you get are the ones that I just said, which is that you get to do local shape encoding now. Uh, we can reason about which 3D points in the posed depth image go to each Gaussian, and therefore we can actually locally encode each region of the shape, uh, even though the original thing didn't know anything about 3D and didn't know anything about pose. Um, it also, uh, the pose is relative to a canonical coordinate system, and so it can take advantage of the shape priors within that canonical coordinate system, uh, which is in contrast to, I think other people have argued like PIFU or MeshRCNN that estimation in a camera coordinate system is better so that you can be tightly tied to the images. Uh, my personal feeling is, is that estimating pose and estimating depth or certainly pose is um, worth it from a perspective of that allows you to then tie the pixels to the, ob the observation to, the, to the, the shape and take advantage of the shape prior together. And so rather than predicting in a camera coordinate system where you have to be invariant to, to you know, camera, camera pose, uh, I, to me, that seems like a loss. Um, can back that up a little bit with uh, experiments. Uh, this is not published and it's, it's not complete. So, you know, take everything with a grain of salt here. But if we run a depth estimation, just an off the shelf, you know, go to, you know, computer vision papers with code and pull out uh, a recent depth estimator, this is the kind of result you would get. The top thing on the left, the surface is the, the ground truth surface and the point clouds here are visualizations of the estimated depths. They're not perfect, but they're reasonable. Uh, if you were running off this, uh, a typical pose estimator, this is just actually regressing uh, three off pose for shape net with an, a, a ResNet 50 network. Uh, you don't get perfect poses, uh, but you get ones that are useful. Um, and then if you were to put them all together and run them through an LDIF encoder after estimating depth and pose, uh, you can get IOUs that are in the mid 60s um, for a VAL set on ShapeNet. And I don't put these numbers next to other numbers that other people have done for this RGB to shape uh, task because these are on a VAL set, uh, not on the test set where there's often a half a, half a point difference. And then everybody seems to have a different ground truth. Some people use the octet ground truth, some people use other ground truths. And then some people also use different Im input images. These are from the 137, uh, pixel images. Uh, but anyway, the typical result that you would get from an RGB to pose task on ShapeNet 
would give you for almost every other method, for example, OCNET on the test set gives you results that are in the high 50s, 57 point something, maybe 58, maybe 59. Uh, whereas we're getting results that are in the high, in the mid 60s. Um, I'm sure you're all aware of this paper by Tarachenko et al. that uh, basically, you know, was asked the question, what do these 3D shape estimation papers learn, methods learn, and decided that they're all just doing uh, image, you know, object identification, and then spitting out the shape that of the, the recognized object. Uh, and I think that the whole point of this LDIF stuff with the local encoding is that it can do more than that. It can um, not just recognize the shape, but it's, but it's, you know, maybe it's recognizing local shapes within Gaussians, but um, it's, uh, it's not just globally recognizing the shape with a global encoder and then outputting the nearest neighbor in the training set. Um, it's, it's doing more than that. And so we're getting actually significantly higher results in the task than any previous method that I'm aware of in RGB to shape. Again, these numbers aren't directly comparable to any other method, but I think they're indicative. Um, other questions we can ask aren't just about what input data, but also like what local regions should we use? Uh, this is uh, what I described so far is, is performing a consistent decomposition into local spatial regions. And that works quite well for classes of objects and things like that. But maybe for scenes or you know other things, uh, there isn't an obvious way to learn consistent spatial decompositions. And so what other local regions could you use similar approaches? Um, so one thing that we've investigated so far is uh, Max Zhang, a, a student uh, who's an intern with me, had a paper at CVPR called Local Implicit Grids that uh, was similar. It's, it's a local decomposition of space into grids where each has a local latent code. The grid cells overlap by half. And so the final function the, uh, for any point in 3D space is a blend of the implicit functions that you would get from the eight overlapping cells. Uh, but then that allows you to represent um, shapes that are uh, that generalize better, you know, networks that generalize better to arbitrary shapes and to arbitrary working volumes, more importantly. Um, and so he was able to represent scenes uh, by a decomposition of the scene into grid cells, each of which was a local implicit grid, whereas it would be difficult to have a global network that uh, represented a scene. Um, but then what other local regions are there? We've also done work where we run object detectors and then we, we uh, train the object detector to produce uh, latent variables that can be uh, decoded into um, implicit functions that describe shape. Uh, and so there, the, the local regions are the boxes of detected objects. But um, anyway, there's 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 a variety of different ways that you could think about locally encoding and decoding shapes. And uh, these are just a few examples. Uh, in other people's work, people have looked at not just reconstructing shape, but reconstructing more complex functions, where maybe the the input has more parameters, or the output does. So for example, in shape representation networks, the, you can take in an angle as well as the X, Y, Z, and then uh, maybe you output a uh, radiance field, not an inside outside or you know, things like that. And so uh, I think that's, I think these implicit functions are extremely general. And uh, I think it's really interesting to think about what kinds of functions uh, are worth representing with these, these local, these 3D implicit functions. Um, uh, interesting examples you know that uh, go beyond just opacity and color and sign distance would be like physical properties of objects like if you're in a robotic system could you predict you know if I push here what will happen uh, or you know what is the elasticity of this object at this location um, and I mean currently now you know you, you would have discretized representations of objects based on voxels or meshes or things like that to, to estimate these kinds of functions. And then could you use implicit functions for more than just uh, reconstructing images or shapes, but rather interacting with objects? I think that's an incredibly interesting thing to look for in the future. And then another thing is like, you know, what do you, what do you optimize? What gets inferred per object? Uh, I'm sure you're all aware of NERF uh, that actually 
trains a network individually for each example. Uh, the training times are a day or more, but uh, you get incredible, you know, in this case, image interpolation results. Uh, but uh, previously, I think people really focused on, on optimizing latent codes and not so much, and, and then kind of assumed that the network weights were going to be shared across all examples. But when you can start uh, train, you know, changing the network weights for each individual example at, at test time, I think that becomes very interesting as well. Um, great. So I think that there are lots of things. I think these implicit 3D functions are going to take over the world. And uh, there's going to be lots of different variants that consider different extensions that are listed at the top here. And then the interesting thing is, is that how do they get used in applications? Um, you know, can you reconstruct scenes with implicit functions? Can you track objects by having uh, parameters that are, are about time in your implicit functions? Um, and then can you use them effectively in robotics, for example? So I'll end there by thanking the co-authors and, and collaborators on this project, in particular Kyle Genova, who is a PhD student at Princeton, who has been an intern at Google, uh, who did basically all the work I talked about. Uh, the collaborators also include Forrester Colgo, Freeman, Aaron Sarna, Avni Sud, and Dana Vlasic, who work at Google. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Tom, for a very interesting talk on the latest work as well as your views for the future directions. We have uh, quite a few audience questions, so let me pick a few to start. Uh, there are actually multiple questions on similar uh, point. This is a number of uh, parameters, number of Gaussian blobs, so uh, the number of types of the blobs. For the first project, as well as second, uh, Mona Jalal, uh, for the first project, her question was, how can you be sure 10 is a good number of parameters? I know you tried. Uh, you have tried a five and twenty, but what was your metric for goodness? For right. the second project, uh, Kai Kao uh, asked, "Is the number of Gaussian the same for different shapes? Are there any issues on the uniqueness?" Right. Great question. Um, we did not investigate deeply the impact of the number of Gaussians to include in these representations. Uh, we for every shape, um, do experiments where we, we extract 10, 25, and 100. We almost never look at the 10 or the 25, we just work with 100. Um, and the reason that we chose 100 was we felt that that was probably enough for most of the shapes we cared about, and that the network would learn to set these CI parameters to be small numbers if it didn't need that many. Um, I was hoping that there would be, so there's probably, um, there's, so the, the, unfortunately these visualizations of the ellipsoids are, do not rev show the CI values. Basically every ellipsoid is drawn regardless of what its CI value is. Uh, but there probably are ones, can you see my mouse, Yasu? Let's see. Oh, uh, yes, I can see it. Okay, so there's a left side here. There's another one here. There's another one here. Uh, I'm 99.99% positive that the CI value for that, the, the basically the magnitude of the Gaussian, is close to zero. You know, enough that it doesn't enter into the surface reconstruction. And the reason that exists there is that there are some planes that have wheels or extra engines or things like that that it's useful to have a Gaussian there. But in this particular one, that, that part wasn't needed. And so it probably set the CI value to something very small. So um, although it would be wonderful to predict the exact right number of Gaussians for every particular object, we don't do that. We just predict 100 for all, and then let the network decide to use these CI values to figure out which ones it really needs. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, this is a question for the first project, uh, structured implicit functions. Uh, question from Gaspar5991. How do you derive the threshold value to determine a boundary for shape from the implicit representation, the isosurface value? Uh, other than enumerating values and selecting the best according to the metric, uh, do you have any uh, ideas how to pick the right value? Or maybe it doesn't matter, just pick one, and it always works. Yeah, so the networks are trained such that, you know, based on 
the quality of a surface reconstruction, how well it matches the object. And so the network's trained with a particular ISO value that then goes into the, the, the extracted surface goes into the loss. And, and so it doesn't really matter what the ISO level is, it only has to be the same at training and test. Um, we interestingly pick a positive, we, we, um, we originally, this is a little bit subtle, but in the original version of this project, we allowed the uh, Gaussian, the, the influence of each function to be either positive or negative. Um, and so we expected that the, the interaction of two Gaussians could produce shapes that are richer than just the sum of a bunch of positive Gaussians. So if we take two nonlinear functions and, and they can interact with positives and negatives, they can produce more complicated shape space. Um, we found it was hard for the network to learn in that situation. And then our, our ISO level was zero. We found that it was hard for the network to learn in that situation because it required understanding two different Gaussians together to produce where the surface was. Um, so instead what we did is we, we made it so that each Gaussian produces only a positive value and that their sum is the whole surface. And so there's less of this, the surface is where two things interact. It's, you know, the surface can be where only one thing is. And so then we made our, our, our threshold some arbitrarily, arbitrary small value. It doesn't matter what it is. Uh, just it, it has to be non-zero positive. That's great. Uh, this is uh, another question on the first project. Uh, this is again from Mona Jalal. Uh, this is more like a comment uh, as opposed to a question. Uh, so her question is about the, the interaction between nearby Gaussian blobs. So for in human pose estimation, uh, more for the skin, the multi-person linear model, SMPL from Michael Black's lab. Mm -hmm. For the human pose, uh, they use mixture of Gaussian models to uh, enforce entire penetration penalty. And uh, for the objects, her question is, Mark, does it also make sense for objects? Do you think that the this consistency or nearby Gaussian blobs, uh, somehow they interact with each other to uh, enforce some more like interpenetration penalty? Do you have any uh, insights about this? Um, they do interact with each other, but in, in a positive way. We, there is no penalty that says Gaussians can't overlap. All there is is a reconstruction error. And, uh, uh, but they do end up kind of spreading out across the surface so that they can get as good a, a reconstruction everywhere. That just, the network just learns to do that. And they do interact. And in fact, they, 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 we want them to interact. Uh, you can create complicated shapes by combining multiple Gaussians that you wouldn't be able to get by just a single Gaussian. Um, like the top of the chair here is like, uh, I don't know if you see my mouse, but that's like probably a shape that no single Gaussian can produce, but combinations of them can. Um, and so we want them to react, interact. We don't penalize them from interacting. That's great. Uh, so let me pick one more audience question, then I want to ask panelists, uh, but I'll come back to the other audience questions. And if you have other questions, uh, feel free to use the chat box on YouTube uh, to ask questions to the panelists or the speaker. So this is for the second project, a local deep implicit functions. Uh, this is a question from Aaron Wessler. Uh, could you use stacked LGB instead of stacked depth? So maybe assuming pose for LGB. Uh, just given LGB, no depth of point cloud that measures input. Uh, how do you do? Right. So, um... A critical aspect of this local deep implicit functions is that there's a local shape encoder. And so we actually extract local point clouds for each of these ellipsoids that contain 3D points within each of the ellipsoids. And then we use a point net to produce the, the local features for each of those ellipsoids, these local features. Um, if this was just RGB images, we wouldn't know how to make three dimensional points that would then be able to be locally encoded, um, which goes then again to the experiment at the end where, oh, sorry about that, um, where we actually run an off-the-shelf depth estimator, an off-the-shelf pose estimator, 
So now we do have, we started with unposed RGB images, but after these two arrows here, now we have a three-dimensional point cloud that's like, you know, the result of a posed 3D depth image, depth image. And so then we can do this local shape encoding for that. And again, that gives us positive results. Um, so does that answer the question? Uh, yes. Yeah. So maybe naively just putting LGB to D, then depth and merge. Uh, that's like a very easy way to do this. And oh, you mean if we gave RGB and D? Uh, no, asking? LGB only. RGB so only. only. Yeah, yeah, this is a way to do that. Yeah, and I think actually the right way to do it myself for this kind of application. I mean, I, I think that most people would not agree with that. Most people, some people would argue for predicting um, shape and camera coordinates, which doesn't require a pose estimator. Um, some people would argue for going for a global decoder that goes straight from an RGB image to a local latent code. In my opinion, it's just going to recognize the image, not actually do anything about reconstruction. And so I think this is the a way to break the barrier beyond re re uh, just recognizing the shape and, and spitting out a shape that's from the training set. Uh, that is going to allow local encoding 3D in a canonical coordinate system and take advantage of shape priors. Yeah, thank you. So uh, I'll skip the remaining audience questions. I'll come back later again. Uh, let me uh, ask, say, Richard, uh, one of the panelists, uh, please ask uh, the questions to Tom. Hey, Tom, great talk. Um, so um, my, my question may, may not be surprising. What's really <clears throat> amazing to me is that you kind of get this consistency for free. Um, so I'm, I'm kind of, uh, let me confirm first uh, two things. So first of all, all the models are aligned, right? Uh, within the class, yes. That's They're correct. aligned, right? The shape and, net, shape net, yes. Right. You, you, you seem to mention that uh, you were able to train across all classes and still getting consistency. It's just, I want to confirm that I actually got it right. That's correct. So this, this, this video here is, a single model trained multi-class for 13 classes that range from a variety of things. And of course, it's hard to imagine what the consistency between a lamp and an airplane is. And so I'm mm -hmm. not gonna claim that there's consistency between that, but here's all the chairs and they're highly, highly consistent. And unfortunately the blue ones up here are probably a chair-like thing, but these are really consistent with each other. Fortunately, the path doesn't go from class to class like that. But um, Certainly within a class, they're highly consistent, even though they were trained all classes together. Wow, that's, that's really, I think, it's actually amazing. Um, so did, did you like make an effort to make them consistent or it just like, it just happened to be, I mean, I was thinking maybe, um, you know, more ellipsoids would make it less likely to be consistent and, and less because there's some kind of a constriction in the network architecture, like the, the, the simplicity or MDL. I was thinking there must be something and it doesn't matter how many ellipses you, ellipses you use and, and, and it's just always consistent. That's right. Um, I mean, again, we've only experimented with 10, 25 and 100. And, right. uh, and you would think that the 100 would be the least consistent, but that's what I'm showing you here. Mm -hmm. um, uh, no, I think it's, it's I, I, I don't think we're the first to observe this. Like again, Tulsiani uh, did something similar but with a small number of boxes. Uh, right. And he also observes some consistency in his stuff. I, I think that there's, because these are implicit functions with Gaussians, they have really, really nice properties for the network and the gradients with regards to topological changes and extra missing parts and things like that, that make it much easier to learn a global space for a wide variety of shapes than it would right. be with almost any other representation. And right. so I, I, I can't prove that that's the case, but the, this is, a, I, I think this is an amazing result. Yeah, and, I really think that's and, very cool. And um, I think it's because of the smoothness of the shape space with regards to the variations you see in a collection like this. Right. So I see kind of two orthogonal directions in terms of future works. One is of course on, on the quality side of things, right? When your second paper essentially focuses on quality, but there's actually much to explore, I think on the, on the structural consistency that it's able to learn. I think it's kind of, maybe it's only a starting and there's actually a lot more to explore. Right. So my, my, my second question is, is, is there anything that prevents you from mixing the primitives? You're, you're focusing on Gaussians, right? And then previous work focused on, on boxes. Some people use the planes. Uh, would you be able to mix boxes and, and Gaussians so that you may be able to do better with sharp features, things like that? 
Um, I guess so. Uh, in this particular project, in the first part of the talk, we really only cared about consistency. And so again, like having these functions that uh, smoothly vary across shape variations uh, was a real benefit. And we didn't really care about the shape reconstruction beyond it being a good signal to get the right structure. Mm -hmm. um, in that paper, there are experiments about uh, correspondences, you know, correspondence finding and interpolation and things like that, that, um, you know, are really focused on consistency. Uh, I didn't show them here in this talk. Um, if you wanted accuracy, I think that there are functions that you could consider. There, are other, there's another group that looked at superquadrics recently uh, as a, an extension of these Gaussians, which I probably is a more expressive function and therefore better. Uh, we instead said, if we care about reconstruction accuracy, let's put that on a deep network and let it learn the deviations. And so, why handcraft, you know, more expressive primitives? We'll slide a deep network to it. Interesting, interesting. Um, let me try to add maybe one more, maybe a challenge or, or, or potential thing to think about is a surface details. I always see there's a, a bit of a difference between uh, a lot topological details, like, you know, the slats on the back of a chair versus surface details. I think the latter seems to be missing from all this works on implicits, right? Yes. And, and do you have an, any idea on what might be a good direction to go in terms of uh, reconstru uh, reconstructing either from depth images or from uh, uh, RGB images that then do a better job in terms of surface details? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yeah, the, our results uh, in the second row here are definitely smoother and, and lack some of the details of the first row, which is the ground truth. Um, yes. Uh, that's a good question. I mean, I, I think we think of, of these deep networks as being these amazing functions that can just do anything. And then they are, but by different, giving them different parameterizations and asking them to learn functions that are simpler or harder, uh, we can make a big difference on how well they do. And it might just be that going from X, Y, Z to occupancy is a very, is a hard function to learn. Um, and to get details on, you know, that th this X, Y, Z is in the non X, Y, Z is out and they're epsilon away from each other. Um, and so if we were to somehow parameterize our inputs and outputs differently, we might be able to uh, do something that produces better detail. Um, yeah. And so we still use an implicit function as evaluated by a deep network, but change what the inputs are and change what the outputs are, that, that would be the way to go. And you know, whether it's a Palacian kind of thing or whether, you know, I don't know what it is, but I think that would be the way to go. Right. So the only thing that I've seen so far are these that are doing really well in terms of the surface details are these overfit networks, right? They, they train on, on like a single shape, right? right. And, and yeah. the thing about details is they're not that consistent across different shapes, even within the same class, right? So it's, it's kind of not as learnable as these structures and right. uh, compared to this sort of uh, the other property that is able to do. Right. The overfit networks and like I showed the examples for Nerf and things like that, those are really just in, you know, uh, memorizing that particular example, you know, with with a number of parameters, it's almost equal to like, if you had an explicit representation. Mm -hmm. And so I don't, I'm not sure how generalizable they are, as you said, um, if you could do that, if you could somehow learn details in a generalizable way, which again, I think is about local encoding and maybe local encoding of, off, you know, of, in a parameterization that explicitly handles details better, yeah. I think that would be a way to go. Great, great. So, so yeah, so uh, let, let me pass this to in, you. Yes. Yeah, so thanks, yes, great timing. Uh, let me throw in one audience question, which is really uh, closely following what Richard asked on the different parameterization other than Gaussians or surface details. So the question uh, was from Tommy Myla. Uh, there has been attempts to represent high frequency content using positional encoding, a positional encoding Fourier features or siren activation functions. Uh, siren is S-I-R-E-N. Mm -hmm. uh, how do you see these approaches combined with the Gaussian mixture models? Um, so we actually tried a positional encoding with LDIF after the fact, you know, after the paper was published, NERF came out and we said, ah, take us two seconds to 
see if this helps LDIF. Uh, I believe the result of that experiment was not positive. I don't know. I mean, so Kyle Genova did that and um, reported back that the result did not help. In fact, it might have hurt. Uh, I don't know the details of that experiment and whether it could help. Um, again, these methods like NERF, uh, you know, I don't want to, I mean, so what they essentially do is they are, they're trained on one exact, one example. So in this particular example, I don't know how many input images there were, but, um, uh, you know, it's, it's trained for a day on this one particular scene and has a number of parameters in the network that's an order of magnitude or two orders of magnitude or something like that, fewer than the number of pixels in the original images. Maybe it's three orders of magnitude, but still it's tons of parameters in the network that are essentially evaluating that network is a more efficient way of, of, of interpolating the pixels in the original input. You know, it kind of remembers the pixels in the original input and, and the, the, the evaluating the network provides an efficient way to interpolate them. It, it's actually kind of incredible because it does actually learn something that can produce depth which then indicates that it's learning the right interpolation function. So these are absolutely incredible. And I, I bring them up because I think that they're very, very valuable. Um, but uh, again, I, 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 I don't know. I don't, I don't and, and the reason that positional encoding is helpful here, I believe, is just that um, there, there are very high frequency functions in this that's, uh, for which the pixels need to get separated and, and to make it easier to do that memorization and interpolation. Uh, for some reason that didn't apply for 3D shapes where maybe there's not as high frequency details or maybe the further experimentation would get that to work better for 3D shapes. Great, yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, let us now switch to the, the other panelist, Gordon. Uh, thank you very much for your patience. Do you have questions to Tom, Gordon? Sure, I, I have a couple of topics here. We probably won't get to discuss all of them because this is such an exciting topic. I think that uh, people from all different backgrounds get, get really excited about. I mean, I think the first question was also partly re is related to uh, Richard's last question is this, you know, overfitting versus generalization aspect. Um, I'd say in the machine learning community, people have been mostly focusing on on this generalization aspect, because I think this is what really makes this, this implicit function approach a um, machine learning approach and, and that allows you to learn shape distributions and so on. And that's what, what you showed too. Have you actually done experiments with these mixtures of Gaussians for trying to overfit a shape? Because that seems like an easier thing to do, right? Uh, we have not, no. We've only done experiments on collections for the purpose of generalization. Okay, okay. Yeah, and then so also related to some of these comments, uh, I think Tommy was just asking about sirens and uh, Richard also mentioned these overfit networks. Uh, I'm not sure if everybody's aware of this, but uh, so we put out a paper on archive called SIREN, which is, stands for sinusoidal uh, uh, representation networks. Uh, and the, the idea there was to use an MLP, like a fully connected uh, network instead of a set of Gaussians. Uh, but instead of ReLU activation functions using sine, uh, sine or other periodic activation functions. And the interesting part about that is that the network capacity of such networks is in theory infinite. So they were actually incredibly amazing in not only getting surface details for 3D shapes, very complicated 3D shapes, but entire scenes, entire rooms with lots of different furnitures and so on. So you know, if you're interested in I would say overfitting to individual shapes. I think that was really uh, the main the main message of these sinusoidal representation networks is that they can extremely well overfit to shapes much better than ReLU networks. Uh, so that that's also going to appear in Europe's twenty twenty uh, this paper. And but I think there is a gap between networks like NERF or SIREN to overfit to individual objects. Let's say we've seen a couple of the, the positional encoding, the sinusoidal activation functions, they are incredible at overfitting. Other methods are really great at generalization. I think there's a bigger question on how do we close the gap to be able to overfit and generalize at the same time, right? Um, you know, and that maybe go back to also the, the, this question from Richard on the primitives, you know, what, what, are, what are the right primitives to use? Are we just gonna use some 
yeah, I don't know. I don't have a specific question, you know, but maybe, uh, Tom, how do we close the gap? Uh, that's a great question. I mean, I, I think the point of this slide was to say that uh, there's all these different things are up for grabs with regards to, you know, at test time training the decoder weights, you know, is what, you know, you're saying is overfitting. And then like how much of that is pre-trained versus how much on a collection versus how much of that is, is inferred at test time. And, and then how does that interact with of optimizing the latent code? And I, I, don't, I think there's just a lot of experimentation to be done by probably people who are watching this talk that will invent cool combinations and that are much better than anything that exists now. And I think we're really at a very exciting time where, I mean, in my world, until things like Nerf came out, I never really thought about, you know, training the the network weights, for example. You know, I was just always thought about generalization and and stuff like that. I'm not not actually sure what the where, where the applications are that you know need, you know, that benefit from this versus you know for different trade offs of, of what you're optimizing and when. But uh, I think there's really rich space there and. But to some extent, the overfitting, at least with 2D supervision, is very related to image-based rendering, a topic that has been very hot in graphics for a couple of decades. And right. one of the things we see is this convergence, really, of graphics, uh, computer vision, and machine learning here. And I think that's part of the reason why, I, personally, I get really excited about this topic. Um, right. Yeah, uh, so... So maybe let's talk about these primitives and also network capacity, or just for like okay. a because Okay, go ahead. Yeah. You know, one insight is that the, you know, the the representational power of these implicit representations is not really defined necessarily by yeah, by the number of vertices anymore, by the number of pixels if you do supervision. It's really defined by the capacity of the network or the the primitives to some extent. So, I think it goes back to, you know, what are some of the what are some of the primitives we ought to consider? So you're looking at mixtures of Gaussian, which relates back to, you know, I think I saw this first in this blobby man in one of Jim Blint's first trip down the graphics pipeline book, uh, right? Then right. If you think about a ReLU MLPs. A ReLU is actually kind of like putting a hyperplane in the, in the, in the space. So to some extent, ReLU MLPs, I think I often think of them as just basically a plane-based approximation. Is that... The, yeah, I think that's a good interpretation. Exactly. Yeah. And then these siren networks, I think of them as maybe like a nonlinear Fourier basis or something like that. I mean, I haven't seen anything like that. I mean, it's not a basis and it's not Fourier, but uh, <laughs> something like that. So, you know, should we think more about capacity and how should we think about them? How should we think about these neural network architectures? And again, it's a very vague question. Not really yeah. No, I think you're probably better equipped to answer this one than I am. I think you're talking about replacing signs or ReLUs with other functions yeah, in the yeah. network. And um, I have no experience in that. The Gaussians that we're using are kind of like, you know, as, as the result of the network. And then we use them to do an explicit function, you know. Uh, so I, I have no experience in that. And uh, I don't know. I mean, so yeah, I think you would be better equipped to answer that. I mean. Can yeah. you so for the signs the you're getting details because again you're kind of set you're you're moving points that have similar inputs into you're spreading them apart and able to reason about frequency I guess better downstream. But I think that again there's a gap between let's say people in graphics have looked at all these different primitives for decades. People in the machine learning community maybe look at a few different variants of neural network architectures, but somehow it seems like the two converge where the insights that we've learned on explicit primitives can be migrated into, you know, part of the neural network architecture to some extent, right? Right. So no, I think I that's really about. interesting. Yeah, yeah that, that's really interesting. Yeah. Oh. I don't have anything really smart to say about it though. Yeah. Just, uh, so, so let me sort of mention maybe, maybe another, maybe another diff totally different approach would be to consider things like, uh, you know, a tree based networks, right? So, I mean, the, the, the connection to graph neural networks, right? There's, there's, there are works on uh, recursive neural networks. Uh, there works, it was just called a tree gun. So, so there, there are also attempts on trying to learn uh, CSG representations. 
Uh, I think I think this is just very different compared to implicit. But we can combine them, of course, as well. But I think it's just another um, um, line of approach that could deal with uh, structures and 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 all kinds of primitives. Okay, I can keep going here. Also, like mm -hmm. one thing that I found very interesting as a, as a thought that you also discussed was this idea of these multimodal you know, implicit representations that can represent a lot more information than just appearance and shape maybe. And I think it goes also back to the first project you talked about in that it learns the structural decomposition of the shape. So, you know, maybe the easiest thing to think about is if you have a structural decomposition already, doesn't that learn some amount of semantics about the shape too? Like, have you thought about, you know, doing things like semantic segmentation or other type of semantic tasks? You know, maybe that's the easiest way to think about multimodal in terms of like structure and and appearance, but then of course, extending that later to other- Right. Things. Yeah, so um, everything here is completely unsupervised. Uh, and so there's no guarantee that anything here is semantic. Uh, we are pleasantly surprised to find that the we can talk about these ellipsoids as representing semantic elements, you know, the tip of the leg, the, you know, the, the back of the seat, you know, so on and so forth. Um, but there's nothing in the training that enforces that. If you had parts as part of your training set, so you're using part net instead of shape net, uh, it would be possible to produce, include a loss that says these, these decompositions should mimic the parts of the, semantic shape decomposition, in which case I'm fairly confident that it would just do the right thing. Um, uh, in this case, the semantics is just an emerging behavior, not not uh, anything that was trained for. I mean, it's just interesting to think that these uh, network-based representations somehow seem to internally already learn something about the structure because it seems like the easiest way to represent all these shapes, right? Yeah, like, there's, there's a long history of like minim minimum length uh, descriptions and that being related to semantics, you know, anyway. So I think this is again, learning the easiest function and it just turns out that that produces consistency and semantics. Yeah, yeah we actually looked at uh, Partnet recently and uh, found that like some of these uh, ReLU MLPs also learn consistent features across 3D shapes. And then what you could do is to use a semi-supervised learning approach where you just need a few examples of semantic labels, ideally maybe in 2D even, to then you know, actually label these specific parts. Uh, so I think that that's also a really interesting direction for future research is like these, just like semantics and then also like these multimodal representations. I totally agree that this could really open completely new applications. Yeah, like I agree. Robotics and beyond. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What else? You yeah. unmuted, Richard. Do you have something to say? Oops. No, 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 not really. Yasu <laughs> yes, will go ahead with some audience oh, I questions. See. I see. Yeah, thank you very much, Gordon and Richard. Uh, so we have a few remaining questions on the second project, uh, more for the clarification questions. First, yeah. from Tommy Maila. How much compute time does it take for encoding a scene and decoding a scene? Right. Um, I would have to look in the paper to give you exact numbers. So um, everything is a uh, forward pass through a network at you know at at, at test time. Um, there's no optimization, you know, latent, you know, optimization of latent codes or anything else. It's just from input to output, and uh, so to uh, evaluate the, the the function at a single point, I think is very, very fast. Uh, if you were to reconstruct an entire shape by evaluating it every place on a grid and then doing marching cubes or something like that, then you have to evaluate it multiple times. Uh, I, I think it's much faster than other methods like Octet. So I've already kind of implied that the, the, the size of the networks being here are very much smaller than than the ones that that would do a global function for the entire shape, uh, and and so there I think it's significantly faster than than Ocnet. Um, 
but I couldn't tell you off the top of my head exactly how fast it is. I believe that Kyle has implemented something in CUDA that is quite fast, like multiple times a second, but I, for a shape, but I'm not sure if that's true. Yeah, thank you, Tom. Uh, the next question from William Son. Uh, is the second work still using X-aligned Gaussians? Um, no, it's not. Uh, in the When we published the paper about structured implicit functions, uh, we did not include rotations in the Gaussians. And so there's only seven parameters for a Gaussian. Uh, but when we worked on the second project, we added three, three degrees of freedom for rotation to each Gaussian. And there, so there are 10 parameters, including rotations. Thanks. So the last question from Mona Jalal, for again, for the second project, uh, you get some shape priors. Uh, do you get the shape priors from CAD models or 3D laser scanners? Uh, all of our experiments are on ShapeNet, which are computer graphic synthetic models. Um, so the CAD we, models. Haven't, we have done experiments with humans. Like here's an example. Um, I wish I would, could just pull it up real quickly. Uh, but if you were to take a simple model and train on 2 million different poses and, and parameters for a simple model, and then again, in an unsupervised off the shelf way train uh, structure implicit functions, it'll produce a credibly consistent uh, decomposition into, into ellipsoids for all those different poses. Um, and so we have done experiment with humans as well, but uh, most of our experiments that I talked about here are just on ShapeNet, which are not real scans. Everything's been synthetic objects. Yeah, thank you, Tom, again. Uh, so it's uh, unfortunately time to wrap up. I'd like to thank Tom, Gordon, Richard, for a very interesting talk and uh, discussion, and also the audience for joining, and also questions. Uh, next week, the seminar will go back to Asia. Uh, Gimme Healy from National University of Singapore giving a talk on non-strongly supervised learning for 3D vision. Uh, thank you very much all again, and have a nice day. Thank you for inviting me. Bye-bye. Thank you.